Sometimes life is difficult and you just need a hand to lift you up. The Bible is full of those helping hands, but how do you access them? How do you apply them? Join our weekly conversation and think about the Bible like you never have before. Listen, watch, and interact with us at ChristianQuestions.com. You're listening to Christian Questions. Here's Rick and Jonathan. Bette Midler in the movie Beaches said, But enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? (laughs) I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. I'm Jonathan. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. Folks, we thank you for joining us today. Talk to us anytime with your feedback or questions at ChristianQuestions.com and all our social media channels. Make sure to continue your Bible study after today's episode with our comprehensive CQ Rewind show notes, where we visually and contextually map out this episode's content. Always available on our website and our Insider Weekly Newsletter as well. Plus, make sure to check out our YouTube channel for new videos every week featuring CQ Kids series, our Moments That Matter series, CQ Bible 101, and much more at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Jonathan, how are you today? Great, Rick. Yourself? I'm doing okay. And you know what? Before we get started, Jonathan, just want to make a very quick mention. Today is Memorial Day, and I really think it's appropriate to just take a quick moment and say thank you to those who... um, put themselves in harm's way for us for so many years so we can have the freedom to do the things that we do here. Absolutely, Rick. So we want to take that uh, moment to say thank you. What is our subject for today? Well, Rick, our question is, am I an arrogant Christian? Our theme text is found in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, am I an arrogant Christian? Look, we've all seen arrogance. Sometimes it comes across as ultimate confidence and a sense of indestructibility, and we might admire it. Sometimes it comes across as cocky, self-absorbed perspective, and we're appalled by it. The point is, whether we're looking at someone in their self-proclaimed loftiness in a positive or negative way, we're still seeing an ego gone awry. Having addressed what we see in others, we now need to look in the mirror. Are we, in our blessed positions of Christian faith, arrogant because we believe that we have the truth of God's Word? Now be careful with this answer because in some ways it might be a trick question. So coming up in today's podcast, look, we probably all agree that it's really easy to see arrogance in others. But it's also really easy to be arrogant. We love to point it out, but we don't like it being pointed out in us. So what's the difference between confidence and arrogance? That's the focus of our first segment. There is a simple core fault that invites arrogance into our hearts. In segment two, we're going to expose that fault and give a dramatic biblical example of what happens when this genie is let out of the bottle. Do you know anyone in a position of authority who's arrogant? In segment three, we address the strengths and pitfalls of leadership. We use another stunning biblical example to make the point. This time, it's an example of leadership gone wrong. And you know, just because you might be a follower doesn't mean that you are living in an arrogant free zone. We do a politically free zone here, but we it's we got to be careful. We're not necessarily in an arrogant free zone. In segment four, we lay out the scripturally sound warnings against arrogant followers. And in our last segment, we're going to look into the internal strife and consequence that personal arrogance can bring upon us. And folks, you will not believe how easy it is that to have arrogance secretly be displayed in your life. So Jonathan, okay. a plateful, isn't it? It is, Rick. So, is there a difference between arrogance and confidence, personal pride, and being pompous? Okay, is there a difference between those things? To find the answer to those things, we're going to have to do several things. First, we want to look at arrogance as defined in Scripture. Now, we're going to take a really small sampling of Scripture here. We're going to look at just three Scriptures to give us a sense of what arrogance means throughout the Bible. The first Scripture is... Uh, Proverbs 16, 18 to 19. Pride, 
And the actual meaning is arrogance or majesty goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. It is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Okay, so pride in this proverb scripture has this sense of arrogance and majesty. And I think that, that, that gives you a real feel for what arrogance is, you know, looking at yourself as, you know, from the standpoint of majesty. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really lifting ourselves way, way up. And it says pride goes before destruction. First Timothy 3, 6. And now a new convert so that he will not be conceited, which means inflated with self-conceit, and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. Okay, so in that scripture, it's talking about qualifications for those who would lead the church. And Timothy is saying, look, you know, or, or, or Paul is saying to Timothy, rather, don't let new converts get into that situation because it's too easy for them to become conceited, to be full of themselves, and that's not what we're looking for. And then 1 John 2, 15 and 16, another scripture that helps us to understand what arrogance means in scripture. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride. And Rick, in the Greek, boastful pride means, <laughs> uh, the word is braggadocio. <laughs> Brag, isn't that interesting? Yes. So the eyes of the boastful pride of life is not from the father but is from the world so this bragging so so this bragging sense and so we get the, this 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 feel that arrogance is is a big big puffed up mess from these scriptures and that really does reflect what primarily what the scriptures say about it so jonathan each segment we want to do an arrogance alert maybe we should have had a little siren or something whoop, whoop. <laughs> what's the arrogance alert here any type of self lauding must be carefully watched where is god in my feelings you know, we have to be so careful because if we're patting ourselves on the back, first of all, it's going to hurt your arms eventually, okay? All right? <laughs> Funny. But, but secondly, where is God when we pat ourselves on the back? And, and, you know, that's such an important part. Okay, so we've got a scriptural basis for looking at arrogance. Now let's take a psychology basis to show us important distinctions between pride and arrogance. And we're going to get a couple of quick excerpts from an article called What is the Difference Between Pride and Arrogance from psychologytoday.com. We have the link for you if you, you would like to, to take a look at that. So, Jonathan, first, just a couple of lines from this article about pride. Pride in one's success might promote positive behaviors in the achievement domain and contribute to the development of a genuine and deep-rooted sense of self-esteem. Now, that doesn't sound bad, does it? No, it really doesn't, actually. Okay. Pride in one's successes promotes positive behaviors. It, it actually helps others to lift themselves up as well. Okay, so you look at that and say, well, wait, that's not so bad. And it's not. It's not. We'll, we'll develop this a little bit. Now, the other side from the article in Psychology Today, what about arrogance? Arrogance refers to excessive and overbearing pride. If you're arrogant, you're also more likely to compare everyone's accomplishments against your accomplishments, constantly reaffirming your own superiority. All right, so there's the catch. When you're reaffirming your own superiority, when you compare and say, nope, they're not as good as me. Nope, they're not as good as me. Nope, they're not as good as me. I wouldn't have done it that way. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, then we're in a different place. So pride, there's a place for pride. And folks, as a Christian, you might be saying, what are you guys talking about? Stay with us, okay? Let's develop this because I think there's a, a scriptural explanation and understanding of all this. But there's no place for arrogance. Pride in one's work or accomplishment can be a good thing. Being puffed up never is. Let's, Jonathan, let's go to a soundbite from The Psychology of Narcissism with W. Keith Campbell. And he's going to go through some narcissistic traits uh, in in the soundbite, and you know, narcissism is 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 put is is arrogance really gone way way off. But it's a great way to look at this and get a sense of what we're really trying to talk about, and essentially what we're really trying to avoid. The fifth edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual describes several traits associated with narcissistic personality disorder. They include a grandiose view of oneself problems with empathy, a sense of entitlement, and a need for admiration or attention. What makes these traits a true personality disorder is that they take over people's lives and cause significant problems. 
Imagine that instead of caring for your spouse or children, you use them as a source of attention or admiration. Or imagine that instead of seeking constructive feedback about your performance, you instead told everyone who tried to help you that they were wrong. So that really gives you a sense of arrogance. It, it all becomes about me and not about anything or anyone else. And I become the centerpiece. And of course, we all know that, that when we get into that situation, it's a bad, bad thing. Absolutely. And if you think about the attitude of the world, entitlement is out there everywhere. Oh, I, I deserve this. Right. Uh, and that that's not a good thing. No, and, and entitlement is a good word because when you believe that you are entitled, it means that I believe that I am in line for simply because I am me. And we've got to ask ourselves. Now, look, there may be some things that we are entitled to in life. I'm not saying that everything, every, every use of entitlement is incorrect, but what we need to be aware of is what's real and what's not. What is Christian growth and what is destructive to Christian growth. That's where we want to get to. So we looked at a few scriptures that define arrogance in, 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 according to the Bible. We've got a, a slight difference between pride and arrogance from psychology. Now let's look at a scripture. I love this scripture because it helps us to understand where arrogance can come from. This is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And Jonathan, the, this scripture uses the word boast many, many times. Every time it uses the word boast, it means to make a show. Okay, so it's not just a revealment of something, but it's to make a show. And that's the difference, perhaps, between a legitimate, decent pride and, um, and arrogance, you know, to, to reveal something versus to make a show. So let's go Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Let's just stop after 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. Okay, so boast of your wisdom, make a show of your wisdom, make a show of your might, and make a show of your riches. Those are three places arrogance can easily come from. Okay, here is what God tells Jeremiah to tell the people. Verse 24. But let him who boasts, boasts of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So if you want to make a show of something, make a show of the idea that you understand God. Now, and it's not about, hey, I understand God. It's, I understand God who exercises loving kindness, exercises justice, and exercises righteousness in the earth, and who delights in these things. So if you're going to make a show about something, praise God to others. Not you. Praise God to others. And this is it's just such a, a wonderful way to put arrogance in its place. So, Jonathan, each segment when we have that arrogance alert, and we're going to be working, working on alleviating arrogance. Now, when you alleviate, it means you're going to make something more bearable or try to correct it. So our alleviating arrogance point for our beginning segment is what? Well, Rick, history about our personal areas of strength is an important place to begin for where we are strong dictates where we can also be weak. So, you know, we have to be honest. We have to be honest about our personal strengths and just realize that strengths are an automatic go-to for arrogance to grow in. So strengths are good, but they also can be traps if we don't use them in the appropriate way. So confidence is great and arrogance stinks. Let's just make sure we have our priorities in complete order. What is the easiest thing to forget or put aside that would open the door to becoming arrogant? We're podcasting live every Monday night from 8 to 9.30. You can talk to us direct through our chat at ChristianQuestions.com. We also welcome your comments or questions any day of the week. Just hit the Contact Us button. We're now out of the starting gate. Let's pick up the pace for tonight's topic. Because we're physical beings, we tend to hold on to the tangible things in life far more easily than the intangible. Unfortunately, the most important thing to hold on to is godliness, which happens to be one of those intangibles. Put down godliness and watch how quickly your mind begins to stray. And so, Jonathan, really kind of the foundation of this whole thing is you got to hold on to godliness, both hands, both arms, 
wrap them around it and don't ever let it go. <laughs> That's, for sure, Rick. Yeah. That's well, for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, the, the, the study and the discussion about arrogance is one we have to, everybody has to really be careful with, but it is really important because, you know, as you sit here and, and look, let's, let's face the fact here, you and I are talking about arrogance. Now, somebody could easily say, look at those two guys. They think they know everything. They're telling us how to not be arrogant. I mean, who do they think they are? And you could say that. So it really comes down to if you've got something of value to say, how are you saying it? Because if it's of great value, but it comes across as, as this sense of overbearing and I'm it and you're not, it, it just takes us away from, from that godliness. So let's go to James 4, 13 through 17. These are great verses that help us with the principle of having godliness in the center of our lives. And b- before we go there, Rick, we have an arrogance alert. Oh, oh yeah, right. I knew that. I, I was looking at it, and I thought, I, you know what? And, and this is really what you were talking about. This <laughs> should be our focus. Okay. Going about our daily life with little or no vision toward heaven will lead to dictating our own destiny. And nobody should be doing that. As no. Christians, our destiny belongs in the hands of God. Amen. James four thirteen to 17 kind of reminds us of that in a very strong way. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know your life and who will be what you'll be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, and this is a simple thing. And, you know, Jonathan, James is saying, look, you go about your lives and you're making your plans and you're not stopping to consider the will of God. Now, look, we can go through our, our, our daily experiences and not stop to consider, consider the will of God in every single little thing we do. You know, I mean, when you're going to, if I'm going to leave my office uh, and I'm going to go get gas and then go pick something up at the store, I don't necessarily say, dear Lord, should I go get gas and go pick up the, something at the store? Is that your will? You know, you're going about your, your daily experience. That's different than what James is talking about. He's saying, you in your lives, you're saying, we're going to go create our destiny by going there to make money, to start a business and, and build this or that up. He's saying, and, but you're not saying if the Lord wills. And who do you think you are? You're, you're, you're nothing but like a vapor that just is here for a moment and gone in the next. It's God's will in your life that's more important than you building that business or doing that thing. So he's saying, don't be arrogant in those big decisions of life that say, here's what I'm going to do. You know, how do I know that's what I'm going to do? And, you know, I mean, Jonathan, in, in, in making those decisions, that's a hard thing sometimes, isn't it? It is. And you have to wait on the Lord because when you pray and ask for his direction, sometimes it takes time. Other times it could be an immediate answer. Uh, but if we are truly following in Jesus' footsteps, we want to do the will of our Heavenly Father just like he did. Yeah, and, and you know, we can still, we can make decisions that are not fully correct, and, and God can compensate f- for them. And, and, and overrule. And he does, he yes, does. Yeah, in spite of ourselves. He can overrule on our behalf in spite of ourselves, um, so that we can, but th- the key is to be able to admit that it's God's will, not my will. Now, this is what I'd like to do, and, and I'm sure you've had the same experience where, you know, in life where y- there's something that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And but you're not sure it's God's will, right? And I know in my own experience, I say to the Lord, I really want to do this. This is Rick talking. I want to do this, but I want to do your will more than I want to do this. But I really do want to do this. <laughs> and just in case you didn't hear, I really, you know, and, and it's and it's being honest and and letting His hand guide us. And I think that's really what this scripture is really focusing us on: godliness first. Let's go to a soundbite. This is a, a TED education talk, Why Incompetent People Think They're Amazing. <laughs> I think that's a great title. And, um, you know, this, this gives some interesting statistics about what we think of ourselves. And this, to me, this is really fascinating. 
but psychological research suggests that we're not evaluating ourselves accurately. In fact, we frequently overestimate our own abilities. Researchers have a name for this phenomenon, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This effect explains why more than a hundred studies have shown that people display illusory superiority. We judge ourselves as better than others to a degree that violates the laws of math. When software engineers at two companies were asked to rate their performance, 32% of the engineers at one company and 42% at the other put themselves in the top 5%. In another study, 88% of American drivers described themselves as having above average driving skills. These aren't isolated findings. On average, people tend to rate themselves better than most in disciplines ranging from health, leadership skills, ethics, and beyond. So what he's saying is that statistically, when you look at how people measure themselves, we generally overinflate where we really are in the, in the whole spectrum. Now, okay. Okay. Now, look, it, it probably isn't, isn't uh, intentional in most cases. Uh, and, and you say, well, you know, well I, yeah, I am a better driver than most people. Okay, maybe you are, and maybe you're not. And maybe you're just as good as the other most people who say that they're a better driver than you too. So th the point is we have to be careful because human nature leans us to open the door to arrogance. And so we just have to watch out. And this is a great warning as Christians because the one thing we don't want, well, there's several things we don't want, but one of the big ones is to have an arrogant spirit before God. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to go there. So we need to get to our alleviating arrogance point. Usually, Jonathan, we, we do these points at the end of a segment. But here it's kind of like, let's give you the answer and let's show it in Scripture. So what's the point to alleviate arrogance for this segment? Daily, clearly, and intentionally proclaim God to be our only God. Okay. That sounds so simple. Proclaim God to be your only God. Well, of course he is. Really? How often do we listen to ourselves or to the peer pressure around us or, or to our own desires without consulting God and do things that are, that we may be considering to be a little bit, a little bit off or a little bit too more. many times. Rick. Yeah. Well, and that's the point. Isn't it? That's <laughs> the point. And, and so we've got a very strong scripture on this. Now, this is a prophetic scripture of end times and it really is powerful. I'd love to spend a bunch of time on it, but there's really one phrase in here that in the midst of all of these end times and the, and the difficulty, there's a phrase that jumps out that we need to apply to our daily lives because the arrogance in our lives can be just like the tumultuous end times. Psalm 46, verses 6 to 11. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. So you've got this, this verse, these verses that talk about end times and God, God's will and rule sweeping over the earth. And it says the heathen raged and the kingdoms were moved and the earth melted. No, not physically melted, but you know, you've got all of these hard things happening. And the end result of all of this is be still and know that I am God. That's the end result of all of it. So in the tumult of our personal lives, what we need to do is be still and know that he is God. He certainly knows bigger and better than we do. Amen. And you know, a basic law of spiritual physics is that godliness and arrogance cannot occupy the same space. It just doesn't work. So it's sort of the Joshua scripture, choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Are we going to serve other things, which is arrogance, because we're putting down the creator, or is godliness the centerpiece of our lives? So now let's look at humility and integrity versus arrogance. Remember the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar? 
Oh, it, yes. Yeah, and we did a three-part series on Daniel a few years ago. It was a podcast 813. I don't have a, what's so special about Daniel or something. Anyway, this is one of those three parts. And so let's just set the context here because this is a great example of arrogance and humility in the same picture. Long after Daniel is established as a man of God uh, and a man of honor by King Nebuchadnezzar himself because Daniel interprets the dream and Daniel helps run the kingdom and Daniel and the three Hebrews go through the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar knows God is God. Long after this, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, has another dream of a tree being cut down. Nobody can interpret its dream and the king's all upset, so Daniel comes in and hears the dream, Okay. Here's Daniel's response. Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. Then Daniel was severely distressed for a while. His thoughts terrified him. He answered, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. So, you know, God has blessed Daniel with this instant knowledge of this dream. And it was really bad news for the king. And he doesn't, he's, he's, he's visibly upset by it. And he says to the, the king, uh, you know, may the interpretation be for those who are against you, not for you. That Because he knows it's not going to be good. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, really horrible, actually. So Daniel then boldly interprets the dream as one of disaster for the king because he is so arrogant. And again, the king saw God in his own life. He saw God through Daniel, through the three Hebrews. Many times over, he recognized and actually acknowledged the living God. So here is the interpretation. Daniel goes over all of the things that he knew. And then in Daniel 4, verse 27, here's what he says. Therefore, O king, may my counsel be acceptable to you. Atone for your sins with righteousness and your iniquities with a mercy to the oppressed so that your prosperity may be prolonged. So he says... You have lost sight of God. God is in your life, and you have rejected him from your life because you're too arrogant. And he's saying, please listen to my counsel. Turn away from your arrogance. I'm paraphrasing. Have mercy on the, uh, on the oppressed. Be humble, and maybe God will spare you from what's going to happen. Now, the consequences for this, this, this uh, counsel went unheeded. Okay, Daniel chapter 4, verses 29 to 31 is where we end up. At the end of 12 months. And now let's pause right there. A year goes by. God gives the king a year to show a change of heart. He doesn't give him two hours or two weeks or two months. He gives him a year. It shows you the mercy of God in this. But here's what happened after 12 months. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king said, Isn't this magnificent Babylon, which I have built as a royal capital by my mighty power and for my glorious majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, the kingdom has departed from you. And so for now, the next seven years, Babylon was without a king because his mind he lost his mind, and he was roaming about as a beast. So you see the, the tremendous fall from this huge pedestal of arrogance that King Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel warned him. And the king knew of the power of God and still remained arrogant. But that doesn't end the story. Daniel four thirty four to 37 gives us the ending. When the period was over... I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored the one who lives forever. For his sovereignty is an everlasting sovereignty and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. That's a pretty big change, isn't it? That's huge. <laughs> and that you, is huge. You know, these these words in, in these verses, and there's there's more, he says more. But these are the last recorded words of King Nebuchadnezzar. And I really think he became a full-fledged believer in God. I think that he saw God before, and he acknowledged God before, and he appreciated God before. I think, now this is a Rick opinion, I think he actually became a believer because of the incredible deliverance that he experienced from himself. And what it shows us is that we can, he fell into, su into such deep arrogance and paid dearly for it, but he came out of it. And he gave credit, 
where credit was due. And it was due to the almighty God of all things. So when we say God first, just ask King Nebuchadnezzar about that. He'll tell you a thing or two. <laughs> For sure. So, you know, this is, Jonathan, a really important place to, to, to really dig into the idea of understanding uh, what arrogance is and, and how it works and how we can combat it. And again, putting God first is such a, such a big thing. So the biggest key in life to keep arrogance at bay, again, put God first. <laughs> so what else is new? Arrogance asserts itself in areas we are good at. What area of life bring the most recognizable arrogance? Rick and Jonathan are so busy analyzing how today's issues can be solved by a scriptural approach, they naturally don't talk a lot about who they are in daily life. So that's my job. Here's a couple facts you may not have known about your two hosts, such as, for some reason when Rick wears a tie, it always has an animal on it. Why? We don't know. That's just his preference. Now, Jonathan may not love animal ties, but he has a cool rescue dog named Beta. And now you know more about your Christian Questions hosts. Talk to us anytime at ChristianQuestions.com. Now, back to Rick and Jonathan. So the area we're going to address now in life is probably not the most common place for arrogance to flourish, but it's likely the most recognizable place for arrogance to flourish. Humanity thrives when there is leadership. Too often, this powerful tool of moving groups to action is corrupted by the leader absorbing the successes of those they lead. And so we want to take this segment and look at leadership because too often arrogance follows a leader and oftentimes overtakes that leader and then corrupts that leader. And we've seen it, I don't know, how many times in history with, with, with big leaders in, in, in many places and how many times in just commonplace life where leadership is such a great thing and can be so easily destroyed with arrogance. So what's the arrogance alert for this segment? Being a leader inherently invites personal pride. It distorts that which is sacred to becoming that which can arrogantly be exploited. It distorts that which is sacred. Now we're talking specifically about uh, spiritual leadership here, but you know, any leadership of any people is a sacred responsibility. It really is. In business, in family, in, in, in a school environment, it's a sacred responsibility because as a leader, you are drawing those to follow something. And the responsibility is to get them to follow that which is highest in whatever it is that you're doing. So arrogance can mess that up in a big, big way. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I exert the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock with God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And Rick, um, this scripture made me think of the, the growth that Peter had in saying these words. Do you remember the experience when Jesus washed his feet? Very well. And he said to Jesus, no, not your way. Never are you going to wash my feet. Yeah, yeah. And you hear his words here saying, uh, uh, I, uh, according to your, to your will, um, not lording it over, um, be, be, willing to listen, to be a part of the body of Christ, it, it, it just, his maturity jumps out at me. Well, you know, and, and it really does, because, you know, here, here's the Apostle Peter. He is, he was the spokesperson for the Apostles. He was the one who at Pentecost stood up and controlled the crowd and, and, and spoke the words. He was the guy people went to, and he doesn't, he's telling them how important humility is. But he doesn't say, it's I, Peter, the spokesperson at Pentecost. He doesn't say, it's I, Peter, the one that, that you know Jesus always talked to and that the apostles always spoke through. He says, I exhort you as your fellow elder. He doesn't put himself on any pedestal whatsoever. And you're right, the growth and the maturity is startling 
when you see the mistakes, you know, Peter's mistakes are very easy to find in Scripture. Oh, they are. And and we we look at that and say, oh, it's okay because I made a mistake too. Well, yeah, you know, we're glad that Peter made his mistakes because we learn from them and we find comfort yes. in them. Yes. But we don't as easily recognize the maturity. And the reason we don't is because maturity by definition is understated. It doesn't have to have a light shown on it. It just exists. And so his maturity is embedded in the goodness of Scripture. And so what we're seeing is this powerful, deep, abiding spiritual humility and grace that says, as your fellow elder, trust me when I tell you, you need to have humility to exercise oversight voluntarily with eagerness and be an example to the flock, not a wolf over the flock, but an example to the flock. So it's a great example of how leadership should look. Thank the Apostle Peter for that. So now to alleviate arrogance relating to leadership, what's the point? For leadership to remain effective, the leader must have their fingers upon their own pulse, with just as much intensity as they have them on the pulse of the organization. You know, in, in leadership, it's a very common uh, thread to talk about, well, do you have the pulse of your organization? Is your finger on the pulse of your organization? Do you know what they're thinking? Do you know what they're saying? Do you know what the grumblings are? Do you know what the attitude is? That's what it means to have your finger on the pulse. But what we're, what we're seeing from the Apostle Peter here is understanding that we need to have, if you're a leader, you need to have your finger on your own pulse as well. What are the grumblings? What's, being, what's the attitude? What's going on be, behind the scenes in your own head with the leadership responsibility you've been given? And that's why in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3, we read what he said about being examples to the flock, and then he continues in verses, 1 Peter 5, verses 4 through 7. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, and Rick, that that word proud means haughty, but it gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time casting your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, it's really interesting that in many cases, especially in the New Testament, where arrogance is brought up or the potential for arrogance is brought up, the remedy is right, right follows it. You know, That's right, the humility, right, yeah, Rick? Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and you see it right there. So Peter says, God's opposed to the haughty, the proud, those who, 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 who are, who are uh, building themselves up above, beyond where they should. Now look, There's a difference between recognizing an accomplishment as something worthy versus exalting the accomplishment as something worthy. And Rick, you know, as fathers, you know, we do that with our kids. When they accomplish something that they work hard for, we tell them, hey, I'm proud of you. Good job. Way to go. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? No, no. no, Now, your kid probably didn't do as good as my kid, but... (laughs) <laughs> uh, what, what was that? <laughs> yeah, well, and, see, and that's the point. That's what arrogance looks like. You know, yeah, sure, your kid did well. Not as good as my kid, but, you know, that, that sense of, yeah, I'm better. And that's poison. It's poison. That wasn't Rick talking. That was Rick playing a part. Let's get it straight, okay? <laughs> I want to make sure it's really clear. Because we need to understand the poison that goes, that can run through our words, and it can be a subtle little thing, but what it's doing is pushing someone else down because we're trying to use the leverage of pushing them down to put ourselves up. And that's not, that has no place, no place, no place in Christianity. Here's the thing. Arrogance will stumble when we are humble. God lifts us up in the right way. We, you know, we, we oftentimes don't know how to properly lift ourselves up. Again, it's okay to acknowledge something good that was done. And, and, and to say, you know, to say to another leader after maybe they, they give a sermon or do a study or, or Jonathan, you know, after we do a podcast, they say, hey, Jonathan, you know, really good job tonight. Really good. Thank you for your effort. You know, that's a good thing to say. And, you know, what's and it's, the- not, it's not wrong to say, well, thank you. I appreciate you seeing that, Rick. Right. And, and it's by God's grace that I was able to do it. Uh, would be truthful. And, and, and you're right. But see, to say thank you 
that's really important because you're you, you because when someone gives you a, a sincere compliment like that, you don't want to not accept the compliment because what are you doing? You, you know what I think you might be doing? What? Now this might be a little bit you know maybe pushing a little, but I think that there might be a little arrogance saying, "I can't take that compliment. I'm too humble." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> well, think about it. Why wouldn't we say thank you? Just be thankful for that person wanting to 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 encourage you, you know. So accept it and say thank you. Such an important thing. Let's go back to David Dunning with the TED Education. Uh, why incompetent people think they're amazing. And remember, you know, in the in the previous soundbite, he was saying how we see ourselves, you know, just in a better light than we see others naturally. That's kind of the way we see ourselves, even if it, it may not be true. Well, let's continue this thought a little bit further. So who's most vulnerable to this delusion? Sadly, all of us, because we all have pockets of incompetence we don't recognize. But why? When psychologists Dunning and Kruger first described the effect in 1999, they argued that people lacking knowledge and skill in particular areas suffer a double curse. First, they make mistakes and reach poor decisions. But second, those same knowledge gaps also prevent them from catching their errors. In other words, poor performers lack the very expertise needed to recognize how badly they're doing. For example, when the researchers studied participants in a college debate tournament, the bottom 25% of teams in preliminary rounds lost nearly four out of every five matches. But they thought they were winning almost 60%. Without a strong grasp of the rules of debate, the students simply couldn't recognize when or how often their arguments broke down. So I think a great message from that is every one of us needs to be really aware of how much we don't know and how much we don't see. I see things through my eyes and, you know, it's a, it's a good hint when your eyes need glasses even to just see straight, okay? You know, we see things through our own eyes, and sometimes that vision is simply not complete. And it's okay that it's not complete, because God will, by His grace, make up the difference. If we allow Him to. If we're open to it. And that's where this arrogance of leadership can, can be really, really dastardly. Because if you're a leader, like, okay, I'm the one in charge, so here's my decision. And, you know, like you said earlier, we were talking about, you know, following God's will. You said, you know, sometimes you got to back off and take a little time and consider. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really important in this area. Let's go back to the story of Daniel. Now, Daniel, now Nebuchadnezzar passed away, okay? And again, I really, really do believe, this is a Rick opinion, that, that he became a, a believer, a true believer in God. Thirteen years after his death, Belshazzar, the young, egotistical, I'll add the word arrogant, co-king, because his father, his old father is still alive, makes a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. So, you know, and, and look, Jonathan, kings have a way of just becoming arrogant because everything is about your majesty, your highness, your eminence, you know, <laughs> and just if you are re recognized by those words all the time, it goes to your head. It just, sure. it just does. Sure. So he makes this feast for a thousand of his nobles. Daniel chapter 5, verses 2 to 3. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring in the vessels of gold and silver that his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and the lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the vessels of gold and silver that had been taken out of the temple the house of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and the lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. Okay, so in his drunken revelry, he's expanded and degraded things to now defile the temple vessels and to include women, these women, his wives and his concubines, in this folly, and they, folly, and they all drink from these sacred vessels of God. Now, this is the same kingdom where Daniel is still there, and you have the, the Hebrew influence that was so marked during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And wasn't his history known to Belshazzar? Of it had to have been, right? Of course it was. King now Nebuchadnezzar. This is, this is probably his grandson then. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's his grandson, yes. So 
Then what happens at this feast? We're going to really condense this down from that same podcast that we talked about previously. The handwriting on the wall comes. This hand, I mean, talk about a scary thing. In the scriptures, it says that his knees knocked together out of fear. That's how scary this was. This hand comes and writes on the wall. The king panics. You know, they're all drinking their wine and having a good time showing how powerful they are. So he calls his astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, and he offers a reward to them for to understanding this mysterious writing. Of course, nobody can understand it. Then somebody says, hey, that guy Daniel, remember him? He'll be able to figure that out. So Daniel comes before the king. And now remember, there's this reward that the king, as soon as Daniel comes before him, he says, interpret that writing, and I'm going to give you up to a third of my kingdom, and I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to give you that. And, you know, again, it's the arrogance. What's Daniel's response? Daniel 5.17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the instruction to the king and make the interpretation known to him. So Daniel... Before he reads the inscription, he doesn't leave it, make it that easy. He recaps the history of King Nebuchadnezzar and he reminds Belshazzar of all of the influence God Almighty has had that um, has happened within the kingdom. So he puts all of the history in place and then Daniel directly faces the overwhelming arrogance of this young and prideful man. In Daniel 5, 22 to 28, and we got selected verses here. Yet you, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood and wood, uh, iron and stone. But the God of those whose hand you are, with your breath of life and all your ways, you have not glorified. This is the interpretation of the message, Mini. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have weigh, been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. And that very night, the kingdom fell. Now, you know, again, you have the picture of arrogance with this young man who thinks he's everything. And Daniel says to him, after he recounts all of the history of Nebuchadnezzar, he said, you knew all of this. So you are responsible. You know that the God of heaven was the God who, who took your grandfather and allowed him to be a beast for seven years and then brought him back. You know that God deserves your honor and respect. And in spite of that, this is what you have done. So here's the thing, Jonathan. Who's the real leader here? It's Daniel, isn't it? Absolutely. Who's the one with the title? Belshazzar. <laughs> Yeah. That expires tonight. <laughs> okay? Sure. And because the kingdom is gone. They take over and that's the end of him. And so you see this incredible arrogance of the leader who thinks he's just so big and so powerful. And yet, like that James scripture, well, who do you think you are? You're just but a vapor. So in a situation where it comes to leadership, we need to be really careful. And in our world today, Christian leaders, there's a warning in, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 5, and it's talking about false teachers at end times drawing people to themselves, yeah. and which means they're drawing away from the Word of God. And, and, and that is dangerous ground to be on. Yeah, and that's leadership going wrong. Simple, it's simple as that. It's as simple as that. So we need to be really, really careful when it comes to leadership. Leadership is so necessary and can be so dangerous. That's why the Bible gives us such dramatic examples. So far we have looked at the arrogance of those in power. What do the rest of us need to watch out for? Before we turn the page, we wanted to tell you about CQ Rewind. It's a free weekly service provided by our great team of contributors who help the guys prepare for each episode. It's an in-depth look at their research, scripture, and much more, showing you the map of Rick and Jonathan's content journey. Now let's continue finding out the better answers as we ask the better questions. Because there are few shepherds and many sheep does not mean the sheep have no worries regarding arrogance. On the contrary, we need to double down in our efforts to maintain humility for the temptation of being enticed by arrogance is actually more insidious for those who follow rather than those who lead. 
And that might be startling, but the scriptures bear this out in a really big way. And so just because you're not a leader, you can say, well, okay, I don't have to worry about being arrogant. Oh, just hang on and let's go through some scriptures here, and then let's revisit that thought, shall we? Um, this Just a couple of lines, Jonathan, from an article called What is Arrogance? This is just a small excerpt, from, and it's from personalityspirituality.net. Again, we can get the link for you in our uh, CQ Rewind uh, uh, material. Arrogance is a way of manipulating others' perceptions of yourself in order to avoid taking a hit to your self-esteem. The basic strategy is to get others to see you as special, perfect, or flawless, diverting attention from your ordinary imperfections, weaknesses, and failings, and thereby keeping your own self-esteem artificially inflated. See, now, you, again, we look at that and we say, well, yeah, that's for the leader. No, 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 no. That's for the follower as well. Okay, and here is what we mean by this. Here's the arrogance alert. Do not fall prey to establishing a following behind someone who does not want a following behind them. <laughs> the attributes, uh, the, uh, this attributes arrogance to the perceived leader and exposes personal arrogance of being in the best camp. Okay, so one of the dangers is establishing the the uh, the the divisiveness of picking and choosing the leaders that we want to follow within the body of Christ and that can be a really difficult thing to to deal with now look let let, let me preface this by saying sometimes we find those who we more readily uh can 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 more easily learn from and more readily relate to and there's nothing wrong with that should you appreciate them absolutely should you let them know? Yeah, I think you should. But the key is, what do you do beyond that? And that is what we have to worry about. In this next scripture, the Apostle Paul is continuing his arguments against divisions and placing himself and his friend and brother Apollos into the middle of a very difficult circumstance. And we're going to start with 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 10, and then later on in the segment, we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, but we're going to go just drop in. He's already mentioned himself and Apollos uh, because there was uh, some some follower uh, issues with, with with he and and Apollos, and he's again bringing them up here in First Corinthians four. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant, and that actually means inflated. In be, on behalf of one against the other. Okay, so let, let's pause there for a second. He's saying that I'm talking about keeping things in, in the way they are written to be, in the order that God would put them, and I'm mentioning myself and Apollos in this, because the danger here is that you, as followers, will become inflated or arrogant one against the other, and you're using... Apollos and myself as pawns for your arrogance. Now that's strong language. And these are the followers. These aren't the guys in charge. These are the ones who are following. Go ahead. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So he's basically saying, look, we're all in the same boat here. We're all servants. And you know when you when you start to to elevate yourselves and your group quote unquote you're taking yourselves out of that servitude and you're putting yourselves on a different plateau and pronouncing yourselves different than the rest so paul's argument here is simple everything about the grace of uh, uh, everything about the grace of god through christ is a gift it's a gift and you know we all get the same gift so, the good news. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and the grace that comes with it. So, yes. you know, in, is, it, is it for me to say, oh, Jonathan, you and I got the exact same gift, God's grace and the good news, but my gift's better than yours. I mean, wait, it, how, it can't be. <laughs> well, see, good for you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not good for Rick. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> see, the, the point was they were trying to take something that was an effort of co-laboring, and they were trying to slice it and dice it and create this, uh, this, this, this sense of being better. Verse 8. 
You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. So Paul is being sarcastic. He is. And he's, and he's being simple. You're haughty when you ought to be humble. He's saying, you know, you're, you're treating yourselves like kings. You're not. And here's his conclusion. For I think... God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are disgusted, but we are without honor. I'm sorry, you are distinguished. Let's... uh, you are distinguished, but we are without honor. Yeah, and, and Paul is kind of disgusted, actually, at this point <laughs> when he's looking at this because he's saying, look, you know, let me be honest with you. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. I'm an apostle, and we are here to serve. And if anybody has the ability or the right to be lifted up, you've only got 12 of those apostles. And yet the apostle is saying, you have lifted yourselves up. We were fools for Christ. And you know what? We're okay with that. We're fine with that. That's what we're supposed to be. So, so Jonathan, the arrogance of following is that we can take somebody or some group or something and just build it up to something that it should not be. Rick, before the podcast, you mentioned uh, an email that was sent to you, and I think this is the perfect place for that. Yeah, you know, there, we, we got an email uh, from, uh, from a pastor, actually, I think in, in, um, in um, North Dakota. And there was a, a, a disagreement on, on some, on some pretty big doctrinal things, you know, and asked our, our perspective and gave it, gave him our perspective and he wrote back. And you know, the attitude with which he wrote back, Jonathan, was just stunningly wonderful because you got this sense of someone who's asking with sincerity, who's listening, doesn't agree, but it, it is responding. And, and saying, you know, we're all working toward the same kind of thing. And I just, I so deeply appreciated that attitude because it just shows you that the, when we go about this humbly and, and, and have, have difficulties, we, can, we, we don't have to be beating each other up to a pulp. We can work through them. So, so you're right. It really is a, a, a great example of, of someone being very, very Christian in their attitude, and I really am deeply appreciative of that. So in, in, in this example, these followers in their divisiveness were acting superior to the apostles themselves. And, and the apostle Paul is just bringing it out, saying, look, you know, you're completely in the wrong place. Following can be dangerous. It can really be dangerous. Let's go to a different uh, soundbite. This is from Alexa Fisher, Communication Tips... Uh, and understanding arrogance. And she's going to be going through two of three coping tips in terms of dealing with uh, you know, when you come across arrogance. From time to time, yes, I do meet which one could consider arrogant people. And for me, I, I try to make them feel a little bit more calm around me. Or I create this little space between us so that if there is an idea that's coming out me, I let it float a little bit before immediately reacting. When you have that kind of negative energy coming at you, it's so easy to immediately respond, but you don't want to respond. You just want to give it a little space and say, oh, that's an interesting idea. Okay, I can think about that. Give it some space so you're not getting the daggers. The other thing is, is that you need to be hyper aware of your feelings around arrogant people because subconsciously they're trying to tear you down a little bit because of their own insecurity. So you need to really make sure when you're feeling it coming at you that you're really protecting yourself, that you're kind of creating this bubble and this wall, this invisible wall, like the firewall between you and that individual. You know, and that's, that's, those, those are really important points. You know, give, give it space. And don't react, pause and then respond. And then also realize that if somebody is coming at you, you know, in that I'm going to bury you because I'm better than you perspective, you just got to let that roll off your back. You just, it, it, is, it is not meant to be taken to heart. Now, afterwards, you can say, okay, let me, let me consider. Did they have a point about, you know, my weakness here or there or there? If they did, great, then you learned something. If they didn't, 
great, then you learn something. So <laughs> I like that. Really, you've just got to put things in, in, in order with these kinds of things. Alleviating arrogance, Jonathan, for the next few minutes, let's talk about alleviating, er, alleviating arrogance. What's the point? Never elevate yourselves or others. Never elevate your pastors or teachers. Rather, consider each to be doing their part, just as the least significant one does theirs. And I really am a stickler on this, Jonathan. Look, it's okay to recognize good work. It's okay to recognize someone who's, who's got maybe talent in this area or that, or who's a very good teacher, or who's a good encourager, or whatever it is. It's okay to recognize those things. But it's not okay to lift those individuals above others. Because that they don't belong above others. We all are the same. It's called the body of Christ. It's not the body of Christ in tears. Okay? It's, it, it's the body of Christ together. It doesn't matter which part you are. You have an integrated function with all of the other parts. And again, we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul now is going to be talking about himself and Apollos because they had this big problem with the elevation of leaders who didn't want to be elevated. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 10. For one who says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are we not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. So, you know, the, the apostle is being very plain. Look, we each did what we were called to do. And the argument was, well, you know, the apostle Paul, I'm following him. And the other side is, well, no, we're following Apollos, because Paul didn't explain anything. Apollos, he opened up the scriptures to us. He's special. And so you had these, this argument on both sides, and they're both building themselves up and, and gathering followers behind them. Meanwhile, Paul and Apollos didn't want any of it. They did it all by themselves. So you see, arrogance amongst followers is easy. It really is easy, and we've got to work at avoiding it. And you know, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I love the attitude of Paul and Apollos. Their job was to bring praise, honor, and glory to God in everything they did. And that's all they wanted to ever do. Right. They didn't want anything more than that. And unfortunately, the followers kind of changed or twisted yes. what they actually wanted to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. See, and, and, and what happens is, even as a follower, arrogance seeks position while humility seeks growth. And look, you know what? The two often don't fit together. Followers need growth. And let me clue you, leaders do too. So it's not about position. It should be about growth. And verses 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 3 rather, really make that point. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder. I laid a foundation, the other uh, built upon it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. So the apostle is just explaining, I did my job, he does his job, and you need to be really careful in doing yours. And there's a beauty in that. And folks, really, take, take to heart the importance of, of not putting this individual or that individual up on some pedestal where they can't be reached anymore. It's not good for them. It's not good for you. And it can easily lead to arrogance because that's my leader. That's my kind of guru. Look, it's great to have those that we rely upon. And I encourage that because that's what makes fellowship work. But we need to keep it always, always in perspective. Paul has been firm in these verses. Stop the foolish clamoring that an arrogant perspective brings and start to grow. You can't be seeking position and growing at the same time. The two just don't work. Unfortunately, being arrogant follower is much easier than we'd like to be. So stay on your guard. We have God first, leading and following. What about the arrogance that can quietly grow where no one sees? 
We're constantly looking to our listeners for your feedback on our weekly episode discussions. Let us know if you'd like to hear more topics like this one or new topical suggestions. Keep your comments coming at ChristianQuestions.com and our Facebook page. We're also talking about topics in Reddit, and you should check us out helping answer questions on Quora. That's Q-U-O-R-A.com. We're engaging in convo everywhere. Thanks for listening, and get ready for us to take a deeper dive right now. You know, the difficult thing about arrogance is that it is both an internal threat as well as an external threat. We can look at how we come across to others and see a reasonable and humble approach. But what about what is going on inside our heads and our hearts? How do we measure that? And and Jonathan, this is an area that we have to be really, really careful of. And it's the last segment, and folks, you've got to stay with us for this because this is going to talk about arrogance exhibited in a completely different way that we all need to be aware of. So what's our arrogance alert to get us started? Following our personal human desires brings us to the arrogance of self-idolatry. Spirituality cannot thrive if it is number two in line. You know, that's such an important thing. Spirituality, if it's not first in line in our lives, it can sort of exist but it cannot thrive. And let's be honest, if spirituality is not thriving, then we are not growing as Christians. And if we're not growing as Christians, then what are we doing? I mean, what's what's my life about? If I'm not growing as a Christian, what is my life about? So, how do we deal with all of this? And you know, and this gets into the into your head and into your heart and 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 you know, James becomes very specific here in James chapter 4 verses 1 to 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Them's strong words, brother. (laughs) For sure. You know, and and he's talking about consuming things on your lusts, on your deep desires. Arrogance. Now, oftentimes, you know, in psychology, you know, it's said that arrogance comes from insecurity. Great. That's fine. Don't write it off as simply just insecurity. Write it off as a fulfilling, it's an insecure fulfilling of our our desires, our desire to be recognized. You know, everybody needs some kind of positive recognition. And if we don't get that positive recognition or we're brought up in an environment where getting it requires bowling others over, we'll do whatever we need to do to get what we perceive as positive recognition. And for some people, unfortunately, this positive recognition is beating somebody else down and watching them bleed Oh. Well, it is, you know, and it, it's really sad, but it, it happens. And, you know, and, and narcissism, you know, really brings us to that. And, and the apostle here is being very specific. You're doing things for the wrong motives. You've got to stop. What's the alleviating, alleviating arrogance solution here? Continually reestablish your allegiance. Submit, resist, draw near, and cleanse. Submit, resist, Draw near and cleanse. Well, where do we get that from? Let's look at James chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. And this is the context of our theme text. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud. And that word proud, Rick, means conspicuous or haughty, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, okay, okay, therefore, just, to God. Just, just hang on one second there. Just let's. Okay. Just, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, God's opposed to the proud, to those who are conspicuous. Again, it doesn't mean someone who does a good job and says, "Hey, that worked out really well." You know, I put a lot of effort in it, and there was a really good result. That is not arrogance. That's not the pride that the scriptures are talking about. It is when we inflate those things and we begin to take credit for and put other things down so we can be lifted up. That's the arrogance. So it's okay to compliment, to be complimented, as long as it's sincere, 
but it's not okay to put yourself in the center because that we if you put yourself in the center you take god out of the center god is opposed to the conspicuous the haughty and you know when you make yourself conspicuous it's like somebody's going to take a picture of the group and at the last second you just kind of just get in front of everybody and put your arms out you know you're being conspicuous look at me yeah 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 <laughs> it, it that's that He's, he's opposed to that, but he gives grace to the humble. And now, verse 7 of James, 7 and 8 of James 4, um, 5 through 8, verses 7 and 8, give us those four things. This is how to keep yourselves humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I should have said uh, uh, purify. There's, there's five steps, not four. I missed one. Oops. <laughs> Submit. Resist. Draw near. Cleanse and purify. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. When we find ourselves in an arrogant position, I think that this scripture is helping us to say, Here's how to back down from such a situation. And any one of us can be arrogant. Even those of us who don't think that we're so good, we can still be very arrogant. And we're going to get into that in just a, a quick moment here. One more verse, uh, Proverbs three thirty four. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So unto the lowly. Now, what does that mean, unto the lowly? Is the lowly person, and I'm not going to answer the question, I'm just going to ask the question at this point, is the lowly person that walks around dragging themselves around saying, I'm really no good for anything, there's really nothing good in me, it's all God's grace, and I have nothing to offer, and that's just me, and I, that's all there is, and I'm sorry, but you know, I've got nothing, and you know, I am nothing, and can't be anything, but you know, it's God's grace. Yeah, go ahead. I have another verse that goes with this, Philippians 2, 3. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Okay, so is that what it means? You're looking around saying, well, he's better than me, and they're better than me, and she's better than me, and they're better than me, and he's better than me, and he's way better than me, and I really got nothing. I mean, is that what these verses mean? Okay. It, it means you're humble and you appreciate things that you see in others. Okay, but we need to finish that thought. Let's let's go. Let's go to uh, another um, soundbite first from uh, W. Keith Campbell, the psychology of narcissism, and uh, he's talking about causes, two kinds of causes for for narcissism. Listen carefully to what he says here. So, what causes narcissism? Twin studies show a strong genetic component, although we don't know which genes are involved. But environment matters too. Parents who put their child on a pedestal can foster grandiose narcissism, and cold, controlling parents can contribute to vulnerable narcissism. Narcissism also seems to be higher in cultures that value individuality and self-promotion. In the United States, for example, narcissism as a personality trait has been rising since the 1970s, when the communal focus of the 60s gave way to the self-esteem movement and a rise in materialism. More recently, social media has multiplied the possibilities for self-promotion. Though it's worth noting that there's no clear evidence that social media causes narcissism. Rather, it provides narcissists a means to seek social status and attention. Okay, he said a lot of things there. I want to focus in on one thing specifically. He talked about grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. And both of them are not good. We always focus on the grandiose part, and we don't hardly ever focus on the vulnerable part because it's harder to figure out. Now, sometimes arrogance can be manifested in our lack, and that's what I was beginning to describe before. We perhaps cannot do what others can, so we have pride and even brag about our inabilities. The parable of the talents illustrates this. So the point, Jonathan, is it may be, now I'm not saying that it is, but it may be, that when we are taking on that air of everybody's better than me, we are actually creating an attitude of arrogance. You say, well, how can that be? Well, let's listen. I'm going to drop in on the parable of the talents right at the end. Remember, they're all given, uh, one's given one talent, one's given five, one, uh, one, two, and five, or whatever it is, and everybody comes back and they report in. And here's the reporting in of the person who was only given the one talent. Matthew 25, verses 24 through 27. 
And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you had been a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Now, here's the interesting thing about this parable. The man with the one talent comes back and hands it back and says, I knew you were a hard man, and he goes into the description. When the master repeats back, he doesn't say that he's a hard man. He just said, yes, I did. I do reap where I don't sow, you know, and, and gather where I didn't scatter seed. That's why I gave you this money to invest, because that's what that means. And you should have put the money at least in the bank to get something, because that's what I asked you to do. But he doesn't verify that he's a hard man. He is an exacting uh, master who said, this is your job. Multiply this. Okay, so here's the thing. The guy with the one talent, he figures he's got the master all figured out. So he's jumping way ahead and saying, I'm just going to I'm just going to wrap this thing in a napkin and keep it safe and just give it back to him because I know him. He's a hard man. And, you know, I'm going to give him back what he's what he gave me and he'll be fine. So the arrogance of thinking, you know, what your master is thinking. And I think that it says he was afraid and that's what drew him to that action. But Jonathan, that's an arrogant thought because Jesus is speaking about his going and, and returning. Okay. Right. So right. Jesus is the master here. And do we have a sense of what, what God's providence through, through our Lord Jesus is going to, to bring to us? And do we bury our talents instead of using them yeah, yeah. to do the Lord's will and to honor him? Yeah. 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 We, so, so, um, and, and yeah, and he did. This is, I, I would confuse the pounds. He buried the talent in the ground. So here's the thing. The, it was arrogant of the person with the one talent to do nothing with it because he figured he knew the future. That is, that, that really makes sense. So here's the danger. And I know, look, and I know a lot of us do this. So when, when I describe this, don't say, oh, Rick thinks I'm arrogant. <laughs> no, Rick is just trying to be warning everybody because we all look into the future and we all figure we know kind of where the Lord's going to bring this, that, or the other thing. But we don't know. And it's arrogant to, to, to park ourselves into figuring out the future instead of waiting for God to unfold it. It's arrogant. And so when we have little, we maybe don't have the talents of somebody else or the abilities or the opportunities or whatever it is. If we're saying, well, you know, I've got nothing, I've got nothing, I've got nothing. Why did God call you? Because they had something. Yes. And that's the point. We all have something. Even if it's the power of prayer. Even if it's the power of just of, of lending a hand. Even if it's not something great. You know what it says about the body of Christ? That the lesser members of the body have greater honor. And so it's a very distinct possibility that we can get become arrogant in our thinking, well, the Lord doesn't have anything for me anyway, you know, anything big and special, so I'll just kind of stay on the sideline. Who do you think you are? God didn't call you to stay on the sideline. Be engaged however it is you can be. So we've got to be really careful of that, Jonathan. Okay, the one Makes sense. the one talented servant figured he knew the master's mind and he could step ahead of him, but he was wrong. He was wrong. Last soundbite. This is from Alexa Fisher, and this is great because what she does in this soundbite is she gives us a very practical sense of handling somebody who's arrogant. I love what she says here. And then thirdly, really send them some compassion. If you know that it's coming from a place of insecurity or you have a hunch or you want to buy into my theory, send them compassion because insecurity is painful. Insecurity is something that is, is, is a challenge. So like anybody you would come into contact who had a challenge, send them your grace to help ease their insecurity. And when you're coming from that place, believe me, the dynamics change instantly. And suddenly they feel okay to come down a few pegs and you meet them somewhere in the middle and then you can truly have a meaningful exchange. Try it. 
try it. So you know, you you don't you don't try to match arrogance with arrogance. You send compassion. I think it's such wonderful, clear advice. Just something to to really be 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 focused on. Sending compassion, even when it just irks you. Because look, face it, folks that that are that way, you know, what are they struggling with? You know, and just and just allow that grace to flow a little bit. I think it's great, great advice. Just some some things that we can do to overcome arrogance, Jonathan. From how to overcome the perception of being arrogant. Uh, again, one of the articles from uh, this is from uh, Numi dot com articles. Uh, four points. Go ahead. What's the first one? Number one: Listen, ask questions, and collaborate. Okay. So sometimes we, if we are in a position where we think we might be falling into arrogance. These are good. This is good. Good advice. Listen, ask questions, collaborate, work together, and collaborate means give and take, and that's such an important thing. What's the next one? Share credit and build others up. You know, it's so important to share credit, and you know, may, maybe maybe you were the star for the moment, but who supported you? And maybe you did ninety two percent of the work. Who did the other 8%? If you share credit, as good as you might be, it still goes so much further than hoarding it for yourself. How about the third point, Rick? Don't correct others unless they give you permission. (laughs) That is huge. (laughs) It is. And if we find ourselves volunteering corrections for others, we got to ask ourselves what's going on in my own head and heart. And then what's the fourth one, Jonathan? Seek feedback. And again, seek feedback. Don't ask, you know, like, like the initial quote from, from our, 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 our podcast tonight was, uh, uh, but enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think of me? You know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the feedback we're talking about. No. Okay? <laughs> what we're talking about is putting yourself in a position where you are willing and able and ready to listen. Arrogance doesn't listen. So folks, look. This is an important part of our Christian walk, and every one of us can fall into the issues of arrogance. What we need to do is be aware and be humble about how am I going to help me get out of my own way. I'll let Jonathan worry about himself, and if he asks me for help, I'll help. If not, I can still pray. But how do I get out of my own way so I can get this? glorify God with my thoughts, words, and actions instead of glorifying me. This is the battle against arrogance. For Jonathan Rick and Christian Questions, it comes down to putting yourself in a position where you are willing, ready, and able to fight against those things that take us away from godliness. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our program is subscribing to Christian Questions in iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast channel is. Please rate us and review us. We greatly appreciate it. Coming up next week, we'll be talking about Does the Bible Contradict Itself? Part 2. Some of the things we'll address are Should we kill? Should we tell lies? Does God accept human sacrifice? Are all these things in Scripture? Talk to you next week.